Imposter syndrome. Somebody mentioned it in response to one of my podcasts last week, and I realized that I have not talked about this at all. And back when I was coaching um, business owners and even when I was teaching music lessons, I talked to a lot of people who either were aware that they had imposter syndrome or who had it and were not aware that it was called imposter syndrome. Very briefly, it's the feeling, it's almost like a guilty feeling that you are going to get caught being an imposter within a certain situation. For example, you're a professional writer or you're a professional actor or you're a professional singer and you have this internal creeping um, suspicion, this worry, this fear that you don't belong there, that you're uh, not prepared for it um, in regards to maybe your experience, your skill level, uh, whatever it is, and you are afraid that you're going to get found out. (laughs) In other words, that you're an imposter. Now, I'm not laughing because I'm trying to laugh at people who have this because it's a very real thing. Um, And I want to talk today about what actually causes it and how to overcome it as it, particularly as a freelance writer but this can apply to anything and I just want to share a few resources um, with you my name is Seth Cherpak by the way this is February 4th 2019 this is the story of my experiments with hope it's a weekly podcast that I do to update people on my progress and to share um, some insights and so I want to talk today about imposter syndrome because there is a um, there's a theory that you find in a lot of the ancient texts about what's called the triune man. Um, you, it talks about it in the Bible. It talks about it in the Upanishads. It talks about it in, in the uh, Buddhist. Uh, I believe it talks about it in the, uh, the Dhammapada here. Now, I've got all these ancient texts and have been studying them for a while. And it talks about there being three aspects of a person. Now, I would describe each of these three as your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's like a triangle. Mind at the top, will, emotions. You don't have to put them in that order or arrange them that way, but those are basically the three parts of a person. Now, scientifically speaking, I would describe these as the emotions being the state of your nervous system. In other words, the vibration, the electrical vibration and uh, chemical feeling that you're um, having you know, all the way throughout your body. Now, this is very real. Your nervous system is an electrical system. If you sit in, in a soundproof, excuse me, my, I'm having kind of a rough hair day. I've got a lot of hair for my age, thank God, but it's a, it's all over the place. I realize that. So anyway, um, if you sit in a soundproof chamber, which I encourage you to do if you, ever, if you ever get the opportunity to do it, you can hear two sounds. One of them sounds like an electric hum kind of like a buzzing light. If you've ever sat underneath a fluorescent light that was buzzing and you could like hear the buzzing of it, that's your nervous system. Okay, it usually buzzes. I've heard it buzzes sort of around the the tone of B or B flat. I don't know how true that is, but it is a, a very real thing that you can hear when you're sitting in a soundproof chamber. Your nervous system is is humming with electricity with well not electricity, but energy. And the second thing that you hear is like a kind of a white noise type of sound. These are extremely faint, okay? You don't hear these when you're not in the soundproof chamber because there's too much distractions coming from the outside, but the second sound is your blood rushing through your veins. You can hear this if you take something like a seashell, um, you know, and kind of cup it against your ear. You can hear this, people say it's the sound of the ocean. That's that's kind of the the gag, like you put the seashell to your ear and you can hear the ocean in it. What you're hearing is the blood rushing through your ear. So, this, this movement, this vibration of your nervous system and the rushing of your blood, which of course changes as your heartbeat changes, those are both very real things. In fact, your pet, your dog, like my dog over there who just is, is a lazy bum, he's just kind of laying there doing nothing today, that's what he does every day, um, he can hear my nervous system. That's why your cat or your dog comes and crawls up on your lap when they, they know that you're upset. Their hearing is more intense than ours. It's more keen than ours. It can pick up on these subtle sounds that we can't hear. The humming of your nervous system, the humming of your blood through your veins. Now, when a person talks about, in the ancient texts, they usually call this part of a person their heart. They're not talking about this, this blood pumper right here. When, when they're talking about the heart in the ancient Greek philosophies and in the ancient Eastern philosophies and in the Bible, they're talking about 
this experiential part of a person, their nervous system. There's a there's a neuroscientist named Candace Pert, who's kind of an oddball, but she's a very, very bright scientist who has great work on this called Molecules of Emotion and Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind. And that's her theory. And she she's not like a weird new age person. I mean, she really proves it um, by talking about the way that neurotransmitters transfer from one place to another all throughout your body, not just in your mind, but all throughout your body, that there are these neurotransmitters, these so-called thinking chemicals that are moving all throughout your body. And when you're depressed, you're angry, or you're frustrated, or you're, you're, you've got tension at some place in your body, it means that you're holding on to uh, holding on to an emotion, repressing an emotion. You're not giving it a release. And what will happen eventually as these neurotransmitters are kind of going crazy trying to you know trying to communicate to you that there's pain or discomfort eventually it'll it, they'll become numb they'll build up this tolerance and there'll be literally parts of your body that you can't feel or, or that you're not aware, as aware of as you would be and that's why I, I have a friend who's a yoga instructor who says that when she works with addicts if you tell an addict who has been, you know, um, they've had their psyche kind of assaulted, their nervous system assaulted by drugs for a long period of time, that that they literally, you'll tell them to touch their right arm or touch their left arm to their, their right side, and they really have to think about it because they don't have the body awareness um, to make those types of decisions. And that's part of a part of becoming sober again is, is developing that body awareness and reconnecting with yourself, reconnecting with those repressed emotions. And and there are people who, doctors who ser take this very seriously in terms of how this causes cancer, how it causes certain, um, you know, aches and pains that become chronic in certain parts of your body. So that's, that's the emotion. That's one part of the triangle. Um, in the ancient texts, they call that the heart. Okay, so this is a very scientific thing I'm talking about. That's why I'm breaking this down scientifically. I don't want you to think I'm one of these weird New Age people who talks about these things in abstractions. That's the heart, right? Or the emotions, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, we're going to call it mind, will, and emotions for the sake of this video. I don't care what labels you put on it. It's just important that you understand these things. Now, the second part of that equation is what people call your experiential mind. Um, some people call it your subconscious mind. I happen to think that your subconscious mind is a little bit more than this, but some people when they talk about this, um, they'll actually use the label subconscious mind or your right mind or your experiential mind or your artistic mind. And it's literally the right hemisphere. <laughs> it's on this side, the right, right side. Um, it's the right hemisphere of your brain. Now, I have been reading a lot of uh, um, work by a man named Michael Gazinga. He has a wonderful book called Tales from Both Sides of the Brain. And what he's done is a, he did is a lot of research on people who, in order to treat epilepsy, they cut the corpus, uh, I think it's called the corpus callosum. I'm not sure if I got that right, corpus castellum or something like that. It's the part of your brain that actually connects these two sides together, connects these two hemispheres together. The right side is your purely experiential, what's called the artistic side. Now, you don't have to use those labels. The reason I think why people talk about um, the right mind in that way is because the right mind doesn't have these analytical, logical processes that filters things and puts things into different categories and puts linguistic and semantic labels on them the way that your left brain does. So you have two different hemispheres to your brain. It's really weird because... Uh, Michael Gazinga talks about how when you cut the, the connective tissue that connects these two sides of your brain, that these two sides of your brain are literally, they're not, a, they can't communicate with one another. It's the weirdest thing. Um, they can communicate with one another, another in terms of where um, the right brain controls the left hand and the left brain controls the right hand. That's kind of weird. But the if the right brain causes the left hand to do something, then the, the, the left brain can observe it through the eyes and the message gets gets in that way. But there's actually no communication happening between these two hemispheres of the brain. And they will literally act like two different people that have two different types of thought processes. So getting back to the mind, the will, and the emotions, the emotions, the heart, whatever you want to call it, is going to be your body. That's your nervous system that we talked about before. And the second part is what what I'm going to call your will and then the third part is your mind okay um, the will I'm going to equate with your left brain 
and the mind I'm going to equate with your right brain. So you've got nervous system, left brain, right brain, heart or emotions, whatever you want to call it, um, will, which is the left brain, and then the third, which is the right brain. So, so you've got your mind, your will, and your emotions. When it talks about these in the ancient texts, you'll notice that the descriptions as far as um, what these different parts of the, the person do or how to control them, I'm using um, things like uh, yoga, like uh, Patanjali talks about in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, you'll notice that the terminology that they use to describe what these different parts of your being do um, is similar to what the scientists talk about when they talk about right brain, left brain, nervous system. So those are the three parts. Now, what happens with a lot of people is these parts don't work together properly or they battle one another. And um, a lot of people use their willpower, which is their left brain, their analytical, um, black and white thinking, categorical, linguistic brain. It's on this side. <laughs> I wonder what that says about me, that I can't give my left and right right. Um, but anyway, your left brain, your analytical brain, um, you can use that to sit down and come up with a time management plan or come up with a list of pros and cons as far as whether or not you need to make a certain decision. But your left brain really doesn't have your analytical brain, your will. It doesn't have a whole lot of power to actually make things happen. Now, that sounds kind of weird to people because they think, well, how could that be? If your willpower, the thing that you focus on, if your willpower is kind of how you muscle through things, well, using willpower, you've probably noticed this before, using willpower to change a habit or to accomplish a goal is kind of like, it's like holding your breath underwater. Okay, you can keep it up for a while and you may actually be able to fool yourself into believing that you can breathe underwater, but not only are you eventually going to come up, but when you do come up, you're going to be gasping for air. I would equate that to a person who, by sheer force of willpower, forces themselves to stay on a diet for six weeks. They're underwater, they're holding their breath, they're, they're getting there by sheer willpower, and they think that they're perfectly fine. But then when they kind of run out of air, willpower, six weeks later, they come up and they're gasping for breath. And, and analytically speaking, I'm sorry, metaphorically speaking, that gasping for breath would take the form of just, just you know, going nuts, just like binging on food. You wonder why people do this. They lose weight and then they gain it right back. They, they stick with something for a while, but then they quit. And when they quit, it's like they're almost worse off than they were before because they're just burnt out from pushing and pushing and pushing with their willpower. Your conscious mind, okay, your will, your left brain, is it's the weakest part of, this, of your triune being. And yet in the Western world, we rely so much on our analytical brain, our jibber-jabber, our, our monkey chatter. And listen, I'm not trying to devalue this part of you, but we, we misuse it. We try to use willpower to muscle our way through things. If we don't feel like doing something, in other words, if our emotions haven't caught up with us, if our emotions are telling us no, if our right brain is telling us no, um, it, we still will try to muscle through it. We'll try to analyze the situation, come up with with uh, all the scamming and scheming and time management plans that are going and diet plans that are going to help us, you know, to achieve our goal. But if we don't get these three lined up, pushing in the same direction, working in harmony, well, eventually the the will is just going to run out of gas. The left brain, the analytical mind, that actually allows you to focus on thing, things. That's the part of you that is self-aware in terms of being able to tell yourself stories about what you're doing, narrations, all the, your internal dialogue, all this self-talk that goes on inside your mind that causes you to feel anxious when you're doing something, all this overthinking that um, musicians and performers will call it overthinking, where you go on stage and you, I think you know how to do it, right? It's all there in your memory. Your right brain has soaked in all the information. It's memorized You know how to play the piece um, on the piano or whatever it is that you're doing, but the, the, then the left brain comes in, this analytical mind. It starts talking to you. And it starts talking to you in terms of either self-doubt or it starts analyzing or trying to remember or trying to focus too much on what you're doing. And as a result of that, you end up shutting down these other two parts of yourself. Your nervous system starts working against you. You can start feeling your, your blood pressure go up. You can start feeling your your, your palms sweating. Your, your, you can feel literally your, your heartbeat elevating, your breathing becoming more shallow. And this is happening because the little you, your willpower, your left brain is trying to run the show. And here's the thing you got to know. There's two things you need to know about your left brain. 
Number one, it's only a narrator. It only determines what you're going to focus on. That's it. It actually doesn't have any power to control your behavior. Now, this sounds really weird, and a lot of people who um, are you know, analytical and rational like to believe that they, their the rationality drives their behavior. The truth is that rationality doesn't drive anybody's behavior. Anybody's. There was an experiment done back in the early 2000s. I think it may have been the late 1900s, but there have been several more experiments experiments like this. But the original one was done at the Max Planck Institute. Okay, the Max Planck Institute. And the object of the experiment was to determine um, what part of the brain actually made decisions for people. And they found that when a person made a decision, that there would be brain activity demonstrating that the action was about to be taken, that the decision had been made, and that several seconds later, the conscious mind became aware that a decision had been made. Now, I want you to think about that, because some, some people have kind of abused this, this experiment and said, well, that means there's no such thing as free will. That doesn't mean there's no such thing as free will. That means there's no such thing as conscious free will. It means that this conscious part of you, the part of you that talks to you, the part of you that puts labels on things, the part of you that narrates, the part of you that tells you what things mean, is actually just a narrator. It's just a filter. Now, I do believe that our rational mind can can filter information and feed it back to our subconscious or our right brain in such a way to where it, it can start to influence your decisions, but that's that overthinking process. That's that that um, the analytical process slows you down, right? And that's where you start to get nervous and you start to get doubtful about things because you've got all these ideas going through your mind. You don't know which one is right and which one is wrong. So sometimes when you just have to let the right brain and the nervous system just take over, let your instincts take over, let the skills that you've gathered, um, that you've developed, take over. That's when you really get into what salespeople call the zone, where you just feel like everything is happening exactly as it's supposed to. You feel confident and your writing comes out sounding beautiful or your performance comes out sounding beautiful. That's because the right brain has soaked in all those habits and all that information and it just spits it right back out in the form of a performance that amazes you. And a lot of the time, you know, your, your left brain, it, first of all, it can't keep up, right? It doesn't have any idea because it's narrating what comes after it. Just like this Max Planck Institute experiment told that people that the subconscious brain, the part of us that is not aware, the part of us that doesn't talk to us, makes the decisions. The left brain then gets the memo that a decision has been made and then builds the narration that explains why the behavior was made, why the decision was made. Now, that's remarkable when you think about it. I mean, how many people do you know? Now, this should make sense of a lot of things when you think about it. How many people do you know who procrastinate or who set a goal and who don't follow through with it or who do things and they're like, I don't know why I did that. Or maybe they did it and it's totally irrational and stupid and it sabotages their life. But then they've got this rationalization, right? They've got this narration. They've got this explanation for why they did it. And you listen to it and you're like, that's a bunch of bull. Why would you tell yourself that? Well, I think one of the... One of the most important parts of really becoming uh, a successful person and aligning these three parts of your being is to stop believing the stories that your left brain is telling you because it's not the truth. The thing that's really driving your decisions is happening unconsciously. It talks about this in the Hindu Upanishads. It's, in, it's actually um, in many of them, but it's in the Manduki Upanishad. I had the translation by uh, Shri Pira Sweet. Peter Hiswami and W.B. Yeats here, and it talks about this part of you as being the self or the Atma or the Brahma, and it's the part of you that is literally in control, but it, it talks about how there is a level of consciousness that you get to where you're not actually consciously aware. There's these different four different stages of consciousness that it talks about in the, in the Upanishads where the first and the most shallow stage is the, the processing data processing states. That's the verbal um, communications, the monkey chatter, right? The, the rationalizations, the imaginations, the scamming, the scheming, all that stuff that's going on in your, in your left brain, your will, your conscious mind. Your willpower is not like a muscle. It's more, it, it's more like a steering wheel, okay? If you're in a car, your steering wheel isn't actually causing the car to move. It's the engine 
that's causing the car to move. That's where the real power is coming from. The steering simply tells you which direction to go, where to focus. That's the true purpose of the will. Thomas Troward talks about this in his Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science, where he says that the proper use of the will is not to muscle your way through things any more that you, than you can cause your car to go forward by turning your wheel. You can't do that. But you can change its direction. That's the purpose of the will. It tells you what to focus on. It gives you the narration that says, okay, here's what's important within this situation. Here's where you need to focus your attention. Here's where we need to send the right brain in the nervous system. Here's where they need to do their work. And then once you've decided that, you allow those other two to work through you, right? The, the willpower itself should not be used as a muscle. And that comes to my second um and it's not even capable of it. Okay, that, that was the first point, that it's not even capable of it. And that Max Planck um, experiment proves it. This, your heart and your right brain makes the decision. Your left brain gets a memo, writes a narration, and says, this is why we did it. Well, a lot of the times we fool ourselves into thinking that the why that we did it was the thing that caused us to do it. <laughs> it's not. You're probably wondering what this has to do with, with imposter syndrome. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But as, as you're going to find out soon, this can be applied to uh, overcome just about any self-sabotaging habit, okay, or a self-sabotaging mindset. So you've got your your nervous system, you've got your experiential body, you've got your experiential mind, which is your right brain, that's your emotions, and that's your mind, right? Subconscious mind, whatever you want to call it. On the other side, you have your left brain, which is your will. The second thing I wanted to tell you about your will is that your will um, can only focus on one thing at a time. I mean, think about it. Why are phone numbers, we don't really have to memorize phone numbers anymore, right, because they're in cell phones, but the reason phone numbers were only seven digits long is because scientifically speaking, your, your left brain, your conscious brain, your short-term memory processing, your information processing can only hold on to seven pieces of information. Now, some people can hold on to a little bit more. Some people have a little bit less um, firepower, but there's it, the limits on this are tremendous. The constraints on your will are tremendous. It can only handle seven digits at once. Meanwhile, the right brain the, or the, the part that actually stores your experiential memories, well, we don't know that there's actually any limit to how much information and memory that your, that your brain can store. I mean, think about a, a, if you play music, a, you know, a piece that you know really well or something that you have really memorized and, and you just go on and on and on and, and you know, you recite it or you play the piece and it's like there's this just a storehouse of information inside your brain. Well, if you're even if you're playing a very simple piece of music on the piano or on the guitar, your your left brain, your will can't hold all that information. It can't focus on all that at once. Right. If you're playing the piano and you have to worry about what your feet are doing and what both hands are doing. Your conscious mind, your will, can only focus on one of those things at once. And that's why when you first learn to play a musical instrument, it feels like you know, you're know you focusing on your left hand, but then you don't know what your right hand is doing, and then you're messing up with your foot. And those memories, those habits, have to sink deep into the cracks and crevices of your mind and your, your body. Your, your, there are actually memories that are stored in your body. Candace Perch talks about that. And so it has to get in, – in fact, there's – a a gentleman named Rupert Sheldrake who has done some very interesting experiments that found that he thinks that our memories aren't just stored inside of our body and brain but are also stored outside of us in the collective unconsciousness that, that Carl Jung talked about. This is all stuff that scientists are working on right now but the point is that all this information, all this processing, all these habits that you learn when you become a master at something, your left brain can't contain those things. Now you might be thinking well what good is the left brain? What good is the will if that's all that it can do? Well the constraints of the left brain, the limitations of it are actually its strength because that's what allows it to focus on only one thing at a time. Those people you, you see who have this amazing focus and determination where they can shut out everything else, they can shut out all the distractions and focus only on one thing, that's the, the limitations of the, the will, the limitations of the logical mind, of the conscious mind. It's kind of like when you're looking at you know something through through blinders, well, that can be very dangerous unless you really, really need to focus on that thing. So those constraints are actually your best friend, but you shouldn't rely on it because once you start to, once you start to analyze things, once you start to tell yourself these, 
these stories and uh, try to find a way to stop telling yourself these stories, which we're going to talk about specifics in a moment. If you start trying to just change your self-talk and say, well, I shouldn't talk like that and I should think positive, those are all things you're doing with your conscious mind. The more that you're doing that, the more... Um, the more you're clouding and cluttering your consciousness in such a way to where your your emotions and your right brain, not only can they not really do their work the way that they need to because all this analysis and all this scamming and scheming is in the way and all this jibber jabber and all this, this narration is in the way, but also it starts to feed back that narration and that doubt and that fear into your right mind. Now your right mind doesn't analyze, right? It doesn't analyze and pick apart and categorize and filter. It just accepts whatever it experiences as being real. That's why when you sit there and you, you watch a movie that's really sad, you start to get this emotional response to it and then your left brain has to remind your right brain, hey, this isn't real. You know, it's it, your right brain does not know the difference. It thinks purely in experience. And so when they did these split brain experiments, just to give you an example of the way that this works, they found that if they would have a person focus only on one spot, right, in the middle of the screen, and when you do that, and you, when your brain split, right, in a split brain pa patient where the right and left brain can't communicate with one another, the right brain sees what's on the left side. Okay, it's so just weird the way that that works, but it sees what's on the left and the left brain sees what's on the right. So if you focus on one point in the middle or if you put a divider between the person's you know, eyes right here, they, they literally can't see. If they see something with their right eye, their left brain is seeing it, their right brain doesn't know that they're seeing it and vice versa. For example, there was an experiment that it talks about in um, Michael's book. I can't remember his last name. I just told you it a moment ago. <laughs> I already forgot it. It's in the right brain somewhere, but the logical mind is going crazy now, so I can't remember it. But anyway, um, there was an experiment where they showed a picture on each side. And they showed on one side, they showed a picture of a house and a car, and it was covered with snow. It was a snow scene, and everything was covered with snow. Okay, that is what the right brain saw the left brain saw a chicken foot now this is this is just one experiment but there have been many 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 experiments done like just by, by different people I'm just giving you this as a one example so the right and the left brain saw different images the right brain saw the snow scene the left brain saw the the chicken foot right now the right brain can respond by drawing pictures of what it sees. It can't actually tell you. So that they would do this experiment and they would ask the person to describe what they saw using words and they could not do it. The right brain is incapable of using linguistic labels to describe things. Now, if you've seen my video on, um, this is a different topic, but if you've seen my video on um, in my spiritual um, discoveries videos, about whether or not um, logical thinking or rational labeling was actually the, the knowledge of good and evil that it talks about in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, which I believe it was, um, it's, it's that labeling of things that allows for self-deception. In other words, it's your logical mind, it's your rational mind that fools you and that deceives you because it's capable of putting labels on things and it doesn't have to put the right label on things. It can lie to you about what something means. It can twist a meaning by, argue, by kind of like arguing semantics. You've probably known people who do this where something happens, right? And you're both there, I mean, but when they go back and describe it, the semantic labels, the logical monkey chatter that they're using to describe the event that happened, they're mislabeling it. They're putting some labels on it that wasn't there. And they can literally, if they keep telling themselves this story long enough, feeding this information into their right brain, like I said, the right brain, doesn't know. It, does, it can't logically divide one thing from another and say, hey, wait a second, that's not right. It simply knows what it experiences. And so the left brain, by creating these false narrations and these false labels, can fool the right brain and it can cause, you know, it can also influence your nervous system. If you tell yourself a negative story or something that's totally BS, in other words, these rationalizations, these left brain um, stories that we tell ourselves that we think are rational, we think that we're rational beings, not only are they not controlling our behavior, not only, not only do they not have the power to control our behavior, they're simply narrations of our behavior and they are capable 
of being totally wrong. And that's why I tell people, look, your heart, your, you know, this part of you, it won't mislead you the way that your rational brain will because it can't tell those stories. It can't put labels on things. When the, when the right brain saw this picture of the snow scene, that's all it saw. And, and, and in order to, when the experimenter asked the person, what did you see? It couldn't put a semantic label on things. It couldn't tell a story about those things. It couldn't translate the, that thing into some sort of a logical argument or explanation or rationalization. It's incapable of doing that. The right brain would just simply take the left hand and it would try to, its best to draw a picture of what it saw. It thinks in pictures because it's purely experiential, right? So now the left brain, on the other hand, it saw the chicken foot. And so it said, I saw a chicken foot, right? Now, when the left brain finally looked at the picture of the, the snow scene, they showed the left brain the picture of the snow scene, and they asked, okay, um, what's a word that you would use that this makes you think of, right? Now, remember, the left brain is capable of building narrations. It's capable of connecting two things. It's, it's capable of um, understanding one thing in terms of another, which is really what a word is. You know, when I say that this is a book, well, this is not really the word book. It's it's The book is the label that we put on the thing. In other words, we're understanding this item in terms of this semantic uh, tool, I'm sorry, this linguistic tool that we call a word. It's a word it's a sign that points to it. So it's understanding one thing in terms of a, another thing. And so they asked the person's left brain to, you know, come up with a word that they associated with it or an item, and it, it came up with the word shovel. So they wrote those results down, and it, it turned out, of course, that, you know, the right brain, the left brain saw a chicken foot, but when it was asked to interpret the scene, when it was finally shown the snow scene, it, it came up with shovel. Well, later they came back with the results and asked the person to go over the results and explain why they picked the things that they picked, right? Now, when they asked the left brain, which by the way, just to make this really clear, the right brain saw the snow scene. It didn't see, it not only could it not describe the snow scene, it had to draw it, but it, it didn't know that the chicken foot was there. It had no idea, okay? Vice versa with the left brain. All it saw was a chicken foot, knew nothing about the snow scene until later. So they came back with the results and they talked about, okay, when you looked at this when you looked at this pair, it showed the left brain the chicken's foot, it showed it the shovel. And it said, Why did you pick these? Why did you pick these two things to go together? Well, the left brain didn't actually pick those two things to go together. It just thought it did. So the left brain said, oh, that's easy. You need the shovel to clean out the chicken coop. Now, if you're this, I know this sounds extremely bizarre, but if you're interested, go, just go to, go to YouTube and look at Split Brain Experience done by Michael Gazinga. His name came back to me. And you'll see what I'm talking about. They have done many, many different experiments with this where they have gotten the left brain to tell a story about this relationship between two things that, didn't really exist in the first place. But that's what the left brain's job is. It's to tell a story about the experience. The story doesn't even have to fit the experience. The experience doesn't even have to be real. Your will will lie to you. Your conscious mind, your rational mind will lie to you. It's capable of doing that. That's why, if we're getting back to the, the you know, the uh, knowledge of good and evil, if you look at all the hell that was unleashed, and I don't care if you believe the Bible or not, if you just treat it as a fiction story, if you look at the hell that was unleashed on earth after people got this, this knowledge of good and evil, I mean, it was terrible, the things that happened, the things that people did to one another. Particularly, if you read the book of Enoch, which actually talks about what the, the events that led up to the flood, there were people like eating each other, there was cannibalism, there was violence, there was all kinds of horrible things happening. Well, deception is what allows us to do that, telling us these stories about why we do things. If you look at the Nuremberg trials where they put the, uh, the Gestapo from the, the, you know, the, the Nazi Gestapo on trial, they had a story. They had a narration. They had a logical rationalization for why they did things. 
That's why they say that the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. People always have a story, no matter how horrible the thing is that they're trying to do, no matter how dumb it is. They always have this self-deceptive story that they tell using their logical mind, which is, again, a narrator after the fact. Now, here's the takeaway from all this, and here's how you apply this when it comes to actually aligning these three things. First of all, there's a fantastic book written, written by a gentleman named Lani Basham, and it's called With Winning in Mind. This is one of my, um, this is on my recommended reading list that I did a couple videos back. You need to read this book. Okay, it's going to tell you how to align mind, will, emotions. He calls it something different in here. Um, he calls it the mental management system. And he actually calls it the, uh, what does he call it? The conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the self-image. All right, that's what he calls it. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what labels you put on it. The point is here that what happens when you have imposter syndrome is you are feeling uh, either a nervousness, guilt, whatever it is, it's, it's a bad feeling, okay? The left brain is going to put all of his labels on it, like guilt, imposter syndrome. It's going to diagnose. That's what the left brain does. It's the job of the left brain. But the left brain is lagging behind, okay? It talks about this in the Isha Upanishad. It says, that, it says self runs ahead. The, it, unmoving, it, the self moves faster than the mind. Well, the mind that they're talking about here is the logical mind, if you read that, you know, the, the Upanishad in context. So, this feeling that you have, this guilty um, feeling that you're going to get caught, in my opinion, and in my interpretation, is actually a very good thing, and I'll tell you why. If you feel um, like you could be doing better, like you are that there's a, a twinge of discontentment or guilt or shame or whatever it is that's telling you you could do better than this. You should be doing better than this. If you're going to be writing professionally, you need to be doing better than this. That is your conscience. That's your spiritual nerves. It's kind of like, by spiritual nerves, I mean when you put your hand on the stove and your nerves tell you take the hand away, your guilt as your spiritual nerves is telling you, change direction, do something different. In this instance, what it's doing is telling you to get better. It's motivating you. That tinge of, of, of anxiety that you feel is actually a positive thing. The problem is that when your left brain tells you this ridiculous story, that it's this thing called imposter syndrome, then it just confirms that you don't belong where you are. That confirmation, that lie, that rationalization feeds into your right mind. Your right mind accepts it. It gets into your nervous system, and it just makes you more fucking nervous. That's what it does. And so on, on top of that, you're not only feeling like an imposter, you're feeling like more of an imposter because you're feeling like an imposter. If you can't change the feeling, if you can't change the vibration in your nervous system, you need to change the story that you're telling yourself about it because it changes everything. The story is... As Oscar Wilde said, that the world belongs to the discontented. That feeling of discontentment, that feeling of guilt, that feeling of not being enough. When he says the world belongs to the discontented, the discontented people, people who feel that they have a deficit, that they have something that they need to make up, those are the people who really dig in and work hard to get good at something, to exceed expectations, because guess what? Those people who are reading you or those people who are listening to your, your piece or whatever it is, a lot of the time they have absolutely no idea that this monkey chatter, that this narration is going on inside of your mind. They have no idea that there's something inside you that's telling you that you don't belong there. They would probably be, be very surprised to find this out. As a matter of fact, I think it was, it was Horowitz, the great piano player, was so nervous about how bad his playing was when he went on stage. And by the way, if, if you want to hear how good this guy was, just go, just go piano, pianist Horowitz plays and just type that into YouTube and look for something that this guy played. This guy was a beast. I mean, I, I think he was not human. He was a, he was just an incredible player, but he was so nervous and he had such a deep feeling of guilt and shame about going out and performing in front of people before he was ready. He had so such a strong imposter syndrome feeling, even if he didn't call it that, that there were times when they literally had to push this cat out on stage. They had to... <laughs> the guy was so nervous, he turned around. He tells a story about how he, he started to walk on stage and he turned around and started to walk back and his... his um. 
I can't remember if it was his manager or whoever, but he was back there and he looked at Horowitz and didn't know what to do with him. So he said, I turned him around, literally, put my hand in the small of his back and pushed him out. And when he tells the story, he says that the sound of the applause when he pushed Horowitz out on stage was so loud that he could literally feel it thundering and shaking. Okay, That's what people thought of him. They had absolutely no idea how he felt. Now, of course, that didn't make a difference for him because the feeling was still very anxious for him to perform. But my point is that people don't have any idea. Um, a lot of the time, if you're someone who actually feels like you have, like you're not good enough for something, and you have progress to make, and you have things to learn, that's your conscience telling you to get better, motivating you to get better. If you're that type of person, either a it's not going to be long before you are good enough to where you have absolutely every right to be there. But B, most likely you have very high standards and you're good enough already to where people don't know that you're an imposter. They probably think you're really great and would be very surprised to find that out. On the other hand, a psychologist had discovered that there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is basically says that people who are incompetent, people who aren't good at something, actually aren't self-aware enough, motivated enough to even realize their own shortcomings. Now, if you don't realize your own shortcomings, you're not, not only are you not going to work on them, you're going to feel like you're entitled to get just as much recognition as a person who is working on them. You've probably known people like this. They have no conscience. They're basically sociopaths. And, and when they're out I mean, in the context of the workplace, they're not motivated to get better. They don't realize that they need to get better, and they have this entitlement idea that, no, you know, I don't, I don't need to get better. You need to pay me more. I need to find a better paying client. There was a guy who was looking for a job with me several years ago who was, had graduated from Princeton, and he, I could tell that he had this going on. He just was, had, was overconfident. I looked at his writing. It wasn't nearly as good as the guy who I actually hired for the job who was a drummer for a band in his young 20s who just wanted the right copy. And not only did the drummer have better a better attitude and more motivation to get better, he didn't have this whiny little bitchy entitlement attitude that this guy had. And I suspect that the Dune and Kruger effect was at work. Um, I, I, it wasn't Yale. It was Princeton that I think the guy went to. Did I say Yale? It was Princeton. But anyway... He didn't have this entitlement thinking that this guy had, and so I knew that he was coachable. He still knew that he had room to grow. In other words, he had an internal voice, a conscience that was inside of him, a voice of discontentment. As Oscar Wilde says, the world belongs to the discontented because that's what gives that discontentment, is what gives you the motivation to get better and to go out there and to keep reaching and stretching and trying to get better. And you know what? You're going to fall down more than the other guy, and you're going to feel more guilty than the other guy. Because who doesn't feel like, or girl, who doesn't feel like they have any progress to make. But what you've got to do is you've got to change the story you're telling yourself about this. This little twinge, this motivation that you have inside you, okay? You don't have to call it imposter syndrome, okay? Calling it imposter syndrome, just, it's a self-fulfilling label. It's the motivation to be better. Now, there are practical things that you can do to get these three lined up. That's why I shared this book. And there are other things that I'm going to talk about in these podcasts. But the point of this video is you're a triune being. You have a mind. You have a will. You have, an, have your emotions. Right brain, left brain, nervous system. I don't care what you call it, okay? These three are either going to be in alignment or they're not. If they're in alignment, not only are you going to produce a lot better result, not only are your natural talents and abilities going to come out more, more easily, and more often, but you're going to have a good time doing it. But you have to realize something. Your will is the steering wheel. Your conscious mind, your analytical mind is the steering wheel. It can tell you where to go. But the engine is in here. It's in your heart. It's in your experiential mind. It's in the part of you that won't lie to you. Here's what you need to do. If you're looking for a practical step, and if you, if you haven't got this book yet, if you want... One practical thing that you can do to start lining these things up, first thing you got to do is you got to accept that this is just a narration. That's all. It's not in control. If you try to control your life with it, you're going to have this kind of success where when your willpower is strong, you're doing great. But as soon as you run out, your income's going to do this, your weight's going to do this, your self-esteem's going to do this, your relationship's going to do it. 
if you want to get steady, you've got to get all these things lined up right. Mind, will, emotions. Right brain, left brain, nervous system. The left brain is not in charge. It's just a narrator. So here's what you need to do. Here's one th practical thing that I suggest that you can do. Set aside some time every day to shut this thing off. To just shut it off. To shut the narration off. And to get quiet. Now, this is very hard to do. I admit that. It's kind of like running a mile. When you first start doing it, you're going to think there's no way I'll ever get this. So this book right here, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, in chapter one, he has an exercise that he, that he, um, he lays out in this. Arthur Dykeman talks about this exercise. Uh, many other people talk about it. But in the exercise, you, you take one thing and you focus all of your attention on it. All of your attention on it. I don't care what it is. I really don't care what it is. It can be anything. It can be this. It can be a, a, a jar of sea salt. I'm not trying to be funny. Take one thing, focus all your attention on it. I like to sing a note since I'm, I'm a musician and I'm, I'm auditory. I'll close my eyes and I'll sing one note. And I just focus on that one note. Just focus on it. The will, right? the conscious jibber-jabber, the monkey mind can only focus on one thing at once. So if you really, really focus it on that thing, it's going to try to start thinking of other stuff. Thoughts are going to come into your mind. Just accept them. Don't judge them. Don't think that you're bad for thinking them. Don't go, ah, I'm not supposed to be thinking them. I'm supposed to be meditating. Just whatever the thought is, no matter how extreme it is, no matter how stressful it is, just acknowledge it and let it go. You can do that by saying, I'm thinking about taking the trash out. I'm thinking about my Friday deadline. I'm thinking about how my dog puked on the carpet. Whatever it is, just acknowledge it, accept it, and let it go. Even if it's something horrible, you can't change it, okay, if, if you've got this thing going on all the time. If you're being run by the stories that you're telling yourself, if you're believing the stories that you're telling yourself with your conscious mind, just let those thoughts go. Keep doing that. Keep focusing on the one thing. If you're visual, I don't care. Focus on a book. If you're spiritual, you know, you're a Christian, maybe you might put the Bible in front of you and focus on that. I don't care what it is. It can be a blue vase. That's what Arthur Dykeman focused on. He actually called it Meditations on a Blue Vase. Focus on that one thing. Give the will something to do. And just keep doing that. Do it every day. If you can only do it for 30 seconds, do it for 30 seconds a day, then build it to a minute, and build it to two minutes, and to three minutes, and eventually where you're doing 20 minutes. Do that every day and just still the mind. Finally, you'll get to the point where you won't even be focusing on the hum or focusing on the book or focusing on the soul shaker or whatever it is, but the will itself, the conscious mind, will literally disappear. Now, this, is, this sounds really odd, but I have had meditation sessions where I sat down Put a timer on, and I have been able to shut the will off so quickly that 20 minutes passed in what I believed was 20 seconds. The alarm goes off, and like, that can't be right. Look down at it. Sure enough, it's 20 minutes later. Why? Because that conscious awareness is completely gone. It talks about this in the Manduki Upanishad, which is the sixth of the ancient Hindu Upanishads, where it talks about the different levels of consciousness, and there being this level of awareness where you're literally not consciously aware, but there's still things going on. And that's going to give your, your nervous system, your right brain, a chance to get back to equilibrium, to get back to your natural state again. And if you do that every morning and every evening, you're eventually going to get to the point where when you sit down to write, you'll actually be ready to write because you'll be in the right state of mind. And then when you start to feel that little twinge of guilt or whatever it is, you just change the story that you tell yourself about it. Don't tell yourself a story that confirms that you're an imposter. That's not the true story. The true story is that that's your conscience. That's the thing that's motivating you to be better. And thank God that you had that because you have no idea how rare you really are because you had that motivation. As Oscar Wilde said, the world belongs to the discontented. That's all I've got for today. It's February 4th, 2019. Thank you for tuning in. This is Seth Cherapak, the story of my experiments with hope if you're a writer or entrepreneur, please subscribe to my channel for um, more videos like this. And also stay tuned for my next podcast that's going to be coming out on how to improve your writing skills. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Seth Cherapak. Have a great week.